Isaiah the prophet <clears throat> wrote in the fourth chapter of his short book, he said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And we don't want to fall in that same error, do we? And so we're going to be studying for some understanding and knowledge this morning. And one of the major ways that the Bible expresses truth and teaches truth, and Jesus did this himself, and many of the things that he spoke about was to refer back to stories earlier in the Bible. So in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said after giving all the signs of his second coming, then he made a comparison. And he said the comparison would be at the end of time, if you want to understand what the situation in the world will be like, just look at the days of Noah, right? As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. Jesus also made similar statements about uh, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. When God destroyed those two cities because of their sinfulness, he said, remember Lot's wife. And uh, we could look at many other examples of this. In fact, the entire book of Revelation, or much of it, is really pulling from things found earlier in the Bible, uh, including this story, and we're going to see that. And the story that we're going to look at today has many connections with end-time prophecy. We'll make some of those connections today. Um, but in some ways, this story presents a clearer picture about the final deceptions that are going to come on this earth than we even find in some of the prophecies in Revelation. And I think by the time we're finished, hopefully that'll be clear. And we're going to see these deceptions not only in regards to the world, you know, the things happening out there, but also some of these deceptions that we as Christians and we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians need to be on guard against. Before I go any further, I'm going to uh, ask for the Lord's guidance and leading, so let's pray. Our Father in heaven, what a privilege it is to open your word together. As we do this, we do it with a bit of fear and trembling, because we realize that this book was written not by humans, but by the creator of the universe. And we do it with a bit of fear and trembling, because we realize that the things you say in here are important. In fact, they're more than important. They are life and death issues. So we ask that we would hear and understand your message through your word this morning. Please send your Holy Spirit to guide and direct us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Kings chapter 12. I'm going to start by just summarizing the story. It takes about a chapter and a half. We're going to start in 1 Kings 12 verse 25 and then go all the way through chapter 13. So we're not going to read every single verse right now. I'm just going to quickly summarize the story. Then we'll back up and we'll start working our way section by section through the story and see what picture emerges. And this story takes place um, very shortly after the kingdom of Israel splits into the ten northern tribes of Israel and then the two southern tribes known as Judah. And that split happened after Solomon died and Solomon's son Rehoboam was taking the throne and the children of Israel, the, the tribes gather there and they ask Rehoboam, what kind of ruler are you going to be? Are you going to be like your father Solomon who taxed us and worked us heavily? Or are you going to be a little more lenient? Or are you going to be more like you know, Solomon's dad, David? He was a good leader. And Rehoboam says, let me get back to you in a few days. And if you know the story, you know what he did next. He he first asks all of the old advisors, the aged men that had been counselors to his father Solomon. He says, what answer should I give? And they said, if you want to you know, be a good king, if you want to have a firm grip on this kingdom, you need to go a little bit easier on these folks than your father did. And he said, okay, thank you. And then he went over to the young, young guys, his peers that he'd grown up with. And he said, what do you think? What should I do? And they said, you need to come down hard on these people. Uh, you need to treat them more harshly. You need to tax them more heavily and so forth than your father did. And so that's the advice that Rehoboam takes. And he comes back three days later and he says, if you thought my father was tough, I'm going to be worse. If he did this to you, I'm going to do this and this to you. And so this is when the split happens. The 10 northern tribes say, forget this. We're going to basically form our own kingdom. And so Jeroboam who you'll see right here in verse 25, he is the one that ends up being king of these 10 northern tribes. And Rehoboam maintains control of Judah and Benjamin, those two southern tribes, which is where Jerusalem was. 
And now I'll summarize the story beginning in verse 25. Jeroboam realizes now, a short time later, okay, I'm king over these 10 northern tribes, but there's a problem. The capital of this whole thing called Israel is down there in Jerusalem. That's in Judah, the two southern tribes. How am I going to consolidate power? How am I going to keep people from going to the temple, which is beautiful? I mean, this is still a brand new temple, right, that Solomon had built. How do I keep people from going there and worshiping there? And if they go and worship there, eventually they're going to return to Rehoboam. And I'm going to be out of a job and maybe lose my head over the whole thing. So he thinks about this and he says, okay, the best way to do this is to set up some false places of worship or my own places of worship. And so he does one at the northern border of the kingdom. That was in Dan. And he sets up another temple or shrine at the southern border between uh, those 10 northern tribes and Judah. And that southern shrine or temple was in Bethel. And much of this story is going to focus on, on Bethel and that region. <clears throat> now, we'll read some of these verses in greater detail in just a minute. But he doesn't stop there. The Levites, whom God had appointed to serve as the priests and the, those that took care of the sanctuary and the worship, they wanted nothing to do with Jeroboam's false worship. And so they kind of started drifting down south toward Jerusalem. And he said, I need some priests to run these things. And the Bible says that he took of the lowest of the people and he made them priests. And he does some other things as well. He sets up a false day of worship, and we'll get to that. And so he sets up this whole system of false counterfeit worship. And then he sets himself up as the high priest of this false system of worship. Now, about this time, as things are getting underway, a prophet shows up. And we're not even told his name. He's just called a man of God. And this is the beginning of chapter 13 now. And as Jeroboam is standing there in front of his altar, this uh, prophet comes and stands before him, and he basically condemns what Jeroboam is doing. He condemns the altar and everything that's happening. And uh, he calls down a curse from heaven, and sure enough, the altar splits in half right there, and there's ashes that are kind of dumped out on the ground. And you can imagine how Jeroboam felt about this. He wasn't too pleased. And so he stretches out his hand like this to say, grab hold of this guy, and his hand withers up. Shocking and strange, but it's highly significant in the terms of Bible prophecy. Well, immediately he confesses at least enough to ask to be healed, and he says, please pray for me. And the prophet says, okay, I'll do that. And he prays, and sure enough, Jeroboam's hand is, is healed. And then comes the strange part of the story. As this unnamed prophet is returning home, First, the king, Jeroboam, says, will you come to my place? I'd like to give you some food and a reward for healing me. And the prophet says, no, I can't do that. God told me expressly to not eat bread or drink water or even go home by the way I came. And so I can't do it. And so he starts home a different way. And as we move through these middle verses in chapter 13, there is another prophet, or perhaps we could say a false prophet, that catches up with this man of God, and says, hold on, where are you going? First of all, he asked, are you the man of God or the prophet that cursed the altar? And he says, I am. He says, well, I have a message for you. An angel of the Lord told me that you need to come to my house. And they kind of go back and forth for a little bit, but eventually this man of God is convinced. And so he goes to this false prophet's house, and as they're eating, a true message <laughs> comes through this false prophet and he stands up at the table and he probably points his finger at this, this prophet of God and says, you have made a drastic mistake. And as a result of your disobedience, you will not be buried with your fathers. And sure enough, as he's going back home to Judah that afternoon, a lion meets him in the road and kills him. Now, is that a strange story? A lot of weird stuff going on there. So let's back up. We're going to go back to 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 25, and we'll just work our way through some of the uh, significant parts of this story. And I'm going to start with King Jeroboam. And let's look more carefully at some of the things that he does. Verse 26, Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again to their Lord, even unto Rehoboam king of Judah, 
and they will kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Israel. So what was the, the uh, critical issue in Jeroboam's mind in regards to the stability of his kingdom? If we could boil it down into one word, it starts with W. Worship, right? He recognized that worship would be the, the success or the downfall of his kingdom. So I'm just going to write some significant words as we go through here. We have worship. Now let's look more carefully at some of the aspects of this worship. Verse 28, whereupon the king took counsel and made how many calves of gold? Two calves, and that's because one would go in Dan and one would go in Bethel at both ends of the kingdom. And he said unto them, It is too much for you to go to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So we could add idolatry as another issue here. <clears throat> Verse 29 identifies Bethel and Dan as well. Verse 30 says, This thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one even unto Dan. You know, one question that we should probably ask is, why would all of these people, you know, the children of Israel, why would they so quickly and readily go to worship at these blatantly false places of worship? Just because, even, yeah, he is the king and they had a lot of power, but still, you know, one man's word and all of a sudden an entire nation is plunged almost immediately into idolatry. That should be a warning for us, shouldn't it? Uh, individually and as our nation as well. Are we following what people are telling us? Or are we taking our cues from what God has said? Verse 31 goes on. He made a house of high places, and he made priests of the lowest of the peace, people which were not of the sons of Levi. So I'm going to add to our list the fact that Jeroboam sets up a false priesthood. He's not on a good track, is he? But he's about to get worse. Verse 32, And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month, on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. Now the feast that's being referred to in Judah is the one that God set up. That was the Feast of Tabernacles in the middle of the seventh month. So Jeroboam is now setting up a false what? Day of worship, right? A counterfeit day of worship. Are you seeing any parallels with end time prophecy so far? Verse 33 says, So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart. And he ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. So who was the one that was officiating over all of this? It's Jeroboam himself. And I'll add one last element here. So we have church and state combined together, don't we? We have the king leading out in the, the worship, false worship. Now, if you can tell people where to worship, if you can tell people when to worship, and if you can tell people whom to worship, do you have control over people? There's not much more you can do to have control, is there? So Jeroboam very quickly consolidates almost complete control over society here in the ten northern tribes, at least in terms of worship, which for the Israelites, that was the core of who they were, wasn't it? And we could compare this to Revelation chapter 13, and we could see lots of similarities. We know that the Bible's end-time prophecies Mentioned in Revelation uh, 13 and 14 that worship will be the issue at the very end of time in connection with the mark of the beast. We know that idolatry is a big issue. Uh, there is the image of the beast that is set up, right? And everybody is commanded to worship on pain of death. We could look in history and see that, yes, a false priesthood or a system of intercession for humanity has been set up as well. And there's certainly a false day of worship, isn't there? 
And we understand that that issue in particular, the day of worship, Seventh-day Sabbath versus any other day, but the first day of the week in particular, that will be the pivotal issue that people need to make decisions on at the end of time. And then, of course, the combination of church and state power. So here's part of our picture. Here's who Jeroboam is representing. Now let's go on in to chapter 13. And behold, verse 1 says, there came a man of God out of where? Judah. Now, through most of, I forget, what is it, 300-some years of history that follow between the split of the kingdom and when Babylon finally captures Judah, through most of that time, Judah, by and large, remained more faithful to God than the ten northern kings. So here comes a man of God or a prophetic figure out of Judah. So we could assume that he's a true prophet, right? He is being led by God. He, we could say, has the truth. And he came by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. <clears throat> so I'm going to put man of God. And he's the next significant figure or character in this story or in this picture. Now this prophet, we don't know his name. The Bible doesn't tell us whether he may have been one of the other prophets that is named elsewhere in Scripture, we don't know. If that had been the case, we maybe could assume that the Bible would identify him by name. So it seems most likely to conclude that this man of God or this prophet uh, is not mentioned or found anywhere else in the Bible. He was called for this specific incident right here. And like a good follower of God, faithful prophet of God. He responds to God's call. He doesn't run like Jonah did, and he marches right there into uh, Jeroboam's presence. That's a brave thing to do, isn't it? Back in those days, you just didn't march up to a king and tell him what he was doing wrong. But this, this prophetic figure, this man, has a very specific job, and we could say it's, it's a two-part job. Number one, it's to give a warning message that this worship is not acceptable to God. And as we look at the second half of the story, he was to give that message, number one, but then number two, his job was also to demonstrate obedience to God, wasn't it? And he understood that very clearly because he was asked twice to eat and drink and take another route home, and he said, no, I can't do that. So give a warning message and then demonstrate obedience to God. That was, that was his entire mission in life. If we could boil down this prophet's role in the plan of salvation. It was simply to give a warning message in this setting and then after giving the warning message to demonstrate faithful obedience to God. Now, can you think of any other prophetic figure or body that the Bible talks about that has a similar calling at the end of time? If you look at Revelation 12, 17... I believe that we see that figure at the end of time. Revelation 12, 17 says, The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So there's two identifying characteristics of this group of people at the very end. Number one, they keep the commandments of God. And number two, they also have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And we could look at Revelation 19, verse 10, that gives us a definition of the testimony of Jesus. It's the spirit of prophecy. So this is a prophetic movement with a prophetic message, and they're to share this message with the world. We know it's a message of warning because as Revelation continues through chapters 13 and 14, we have this scenario that's unfolded in connection with the mark of the beast. And it's that remnant of the woman's seed whose job is really twofold. Number one, Give the warning message. We call it the three angels' messages. And number two, as they are giving the warning and after that warning is given, to demonstrate loving obedience to God. That's it. There's really nothing else that we are called to do. So I would say that this man of God is a representative here of the remnant church. Now let's keep reading. 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 1. 
verse 2. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord. And he said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord. Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. Now, talk about a strange prophecy in the middle of a strange story. This is kind of a strange prophecy as well. And I want to point out first that the prophecy is given not against Jeroboam per se, but it's given against what object? The altar, the altar right? And he prophesied against the altar. So what does the altar represent? That'd be my question. In Jeroboam's <clears throat> make-believe world of total control here that he has created, what would his altar represent? Which, by the way, let's imagine this is Jeroboam's altar. He's the king, but he's also the high priest of this thing that he has created. Wouldn't the altar represent that combination of state authority or civil authority and religious authority, right? In other words, it is the symbol of his power and his authority. Turn, keep your finger here. Turn with me to Amos 7, verse 10. I found this verse kind of interesting. Amos, which is after the book of Daniel, a few books back, Hosea, Joel, Amos. In Amos 7, verse 10, Now, Amos was also active at this exact same time. And um, we're going to just get a little snippet of his experience here. Amos chapter 7, verse 10. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, the king of Israel. So now we know the name of one of these false priests that Jeroboam set up. His name was Amaziah, or a false prophet. And he uh, sends this message to Jeroboam. He says, Amos has conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. So he's calling out Amos as a true prophet and saying, we need to get rid of Amos. And verse 11 goes on, For thus Amos says, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. Verse 12, Also Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, go flee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread and prophesy there. See, Amos recognized that Judah was still faithful to God, for the most part. He said, if you want to serve God, why don't you just go down there where people want to hear your message? But leave us alone. We don't want to hear it. And then he says in verse 13, prophesy not again any more at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel and it is the king's court. Jeroboam's chapel that's a religious institution, isn't it? And his court, his civil power, were all consolidated here in Bethel, and that altar was the symbol of his power. I want to ask you a question. If we look at this in its last day scenario, what is the symbol or the sign of the beast's power as it unites church and state? What have we been preaching as Seventh-day Adventists? For decades and decades and decades and decades. Sunday, right? Civilly protecting, legislating Sunday as a day of rest. That is the symbol, the sign of power. So back in 1 Kings chapter 13, when the man of God cries against the altar, he is um, giving this warning and this prophecy specifically against that sign, that altar that had been set up. We apply it to our day we have a message, and it's specifically against warning about this Sabbath Sunday issue that is coming on the world. So he cries against the altar. Verse 3 says, He gave the, a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. Now we come to the next element of the story. And that's the withered hand. So let's just keep reading. Verse 4. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from where? What did your Bible say? Where had Jeroboam's hand been? 
from the altar, right? So we see the significance here. The power of the church-state union at the end of time will be expressed in the Sunday issue. And when that message that we are supposed to give is given around the world, we call it the loud cry. When that message is given specifically against that issue and that legislation, the power of the state will come from the altar or from the power of that Sunday issue. Middle of verse 4, he put forth his hand from the altar saying, lay hold on him and his hand which he put forth against him dried up so that he could not pull it again to him. Now if you turn to Revelation chapters 13 and 14, you will find that the mark of the beast can be placed in two places. And you know what they are. What are they? Forehead. You can receive it in the forehead or you can receive it in the hand. <clears throat> now, the forehead would represent those that actually believe this is correct. They are totally bought in or totally sold out, whatever it may be, to this way of thinking. And the hand would represent those that either don't really believe, maybe they're atheists, they don't care at all about spiritual things or a day of worship, but they'll just go along with it. That would be represented by the hand. So here we have in the, our story today a mark being placed in the hand. It's interesting, and we're not going to look at the story. There is another story some years later, another king here in Israel that does a similar mistake. He goes into the temple, and he basically combines the power of church and state. This is King Uzziah. And when he is confronted by faithful priests, and he reaches out his hand to lay hold on them, he receives leprosy in the forehead. And you look at those two stories together, very clear picture here in the Old Testament about what the issue of the mark of the beast is. It's when church and state unite together to enforce false worship. You receive a mark in the forehead or a mark in the hand, especially when persecution is added to the mix. So his hand dries up that he cannot pull it again to him. The withered hand then is a symbol of the mark of the beast. Verse 5, the altar was rent and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God and pray for me that, thy, that my hand may be restored again. Now, was this genuine repentance on Jeroboam's part? <laughs> How do we know it wasn't genuine? Because if we read the rest of Jeroboam's story, he continues down the same path path. Once he got his hand back, it made no difference in his life, in his heart, in his thinking at all. And the Bible is very clear that Israel's apostasy and eventual complete obliteration stemmed from Jeroboam and everything that he did. It was this sin that, that pushed them in this direction. So this is not genuine uh, repentance or conversion. He just wants his hand back. But look what happens. Verse 6 in the middle. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was what? God answers his prayer. And he heals the hand of this rebellious king nonetheless, and it became as it was before. So this unnamed prophet that shows up on the scene, whose sole purpose is to issue a warning against this issue and then to demonstrate obedience also has a health ministry, doesn't he? Because he heals the king. And he does it through natural means, reliance on God. So I'm just going to add, this man also has a health ministry. Now, as Seventh-day Adventists, have we been given a health message? What do we often call that health message? It's the well, for you, it's this side, right? The right arm of the gospel. I would assume that Jeroboam stretched out his right hand, unless he was left-handed. He probably stretched out his right hand, and that was the hand that withered up. And God restores the right hand of this king in an effort to win his heart. It doesn't work. 
What has God done for you, right? That's a question we should ask. What has God done for me? What is God trying to do to win my heart? Will I allow myself to be softened and one to God and His love, or am I going to continue down this path like Jeroboam did? And then the king, this is verses 7, 8, and 9. Then the king says, this is amazing. Yeah, you destroyed my altar, but you also healed me. Uh, Will you come to my house and eat with me? And this unnamed prophet of God wisely and obediently says, no, I can't. I can't do that. Now verse 11. You know, if we could just stop the story at the end of verse 10, this would be a really great story. But it doesn't stop there. Verse 11 says, Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel. And his son came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. The words which he had spoken unto the king, them they told also to their father. So we're going to add false prophet. And he eventually catches up with uh, this man of God who is headed back home, and he convinces him to come. Now, how did he convince this man of God to disobey God's command and come home? We find the answer in verse 18. So let's look at that. Verse 18. He said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. My brother the prophet, right? Maybe he patted him on the back when he said that. And an angel spoke unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. What better way to lead astray a prophet than to give him a prophetic message? See, the devil had already tried through King Jeroboam bribery and reward, hadn't he? And that didn't work. The prophet recognized that one right away. He was quick. He was sharp. But when a prophetic message came, he was interested. He was intrigued. And he started listening. And maybe kind of like Eve under that tree, he started thinking, well, maybe there's something to it. An angel spoke to him after all. Now, our scripture today was from 2 Corinthians. And we are told that the devil will use false, all kinds of false things at the end of time, including false prophetic messages. So 2 Corinthians 11 verse 13 says, such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. So we know this, just because somebody claims uh, to serve God, just because somebody claims to uh, be a minister or a pastor or whatever kind of spiritual leader, we know this, this isn't just reason to blindly accept what they say we're aware of that and then verse 14 says no marvel for satan himself is transformed into an angel of light now i want to read for you briefly from great controversy page 624 you may have noticed that i had trouble deciding what the title should be in the bulletin it's called adventism's final deceptions i believe (laughs) And on your sheet, it's lessons from a slain prophet. So what are, or what is the very final deception that Satan is going to try to bring on earth as he is transformed into an angel of light? We're actually given the answer here in Great Controversy, page 624. And it has to do with all of this issue right here. So here's what we read. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. Now, do you think he's going to personate Christ by putting on the, 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 the little horns and the red wings and the cloven feet and the pitchfork and say, here I am, I'm Christ? No, I don't think so either. He's going to appear as, well, we're actually given the description right here. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness, resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in Revelation. Now we were talking in Sabbath school about living by faith. And this is one huge reason why it's going to be so important to live by faith in this book rather than what we see or hear. 
because this is going to be a counterfeit unlike anything any human being has ever seen. And if you think that you can trust your senses, uh, you'll be misled. What happens next? The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout of triumph rings out upon the air. Christ has come. Christ has come. The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him while he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them as Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon the earth. His voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody. In gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which the Savior uttered. He heals the diseases of the people. This could be amazing, right? Talk about 24-7 news coverage. It's going to be on all the networks, right? No matter where you turn, you'll be hearing about this person, Christ, who's doing all of these things. But what happens next? Then, in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday. And friends, right there, that is the only clue you need to know that this is not the real Jesus. Because Jesus will never contradict what he has already written in this book right here. No matter what miracles are being done, we need to know what this book says. And we need to know it for ourselves, right? That's why we each need to be studying uh, for ourselves. And then he commands all the howl of the day which he has blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with light and truth. This is the strong, almost overmastering delusion. I'm going to just read. This is the bottom of the next page, page 625. We're asked this question. Are the people of God now so firmly established upon his word that they would not yield to the evidence of their senses? It's a challenge, isn't it? We live in a very sensory world. I mean, God created us with amazing senses, and they're supposed to be blessings. But like everything else God has created, the devil will take that and try to use it to his purposes. So, whatever the Lord's doing in your life right now, take it as his way of trying to help you learn to live by faith, not by sight, not by sound, not by your senses. Back in our story, 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 18 this man of God, the, the true prophet, he is misled because someone says, I have a prophetic message from God. An angel told me this. But that message does not match with the word of God that had already been given to him. And God will never contradict himself. Verse 19 says, So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house, and then he drank water. And then we already referred to this. This false prophet actually receives a, a true message from the Lord, and he says, you've made a bad mistake, and you're never going to make it home. Now let's jump to the end of the story, verse 23. And it came to pass, after he had eaten bread, and after he had drunk, that he saddled for him the ass, to wit for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way, and slew him. And his carcass was cast in the way, and the ass stood by it, and the lion also stood by the carcass. Now, this is more strange stuff going on, right? Most lions won't just kill a person and then stay standing there while there's a perfectly good donkey to eat also right beside them, right? This is really weird. This is strange. And it catches the attention of the people of the area as they... I don't know if they rode right by, or I think I would have kind of taken the, the long route around. But anyways, they report what has happened, and they take the news back to the city where the old prophet lives. And they come and they, they get the body of the man of God, and he actually ends up burying this man of God. The false prophet puts him in his own tomb, and he eventually ends up being buried next to him. But I want to come back as we finish here to the question about the lion. Now, verse 24 says, When he was gone, a lion met him by the way, and he slew him. Notice it doesn't say that a lion leapt out of the tree and tackled him from behind and threw him to the ground. Now, it may have happened. 
But the Bible's way of describing it is simply that the lion met him on the way, almost as if we were walking toward each other on a road and we meet and you would wave or say hi or shake hands or whatever. It's, the Bible's way of describing this is very interesting. Okay, so we're going to come back to that question in just a moment. I want to ask another question. Where was this prophet from? Do you remember? He was from Judah. Now, if you saw the map again, Judah's down here. The ten northern tribes are here, and Bethel is right at the border. If you look at a map, I mean, it's within a mile or two of where that boundary would have been. So as the man of God leaves the false prophet's house and goes on his way home, which direction is he probably going? Back down to Judah. Where most likely then is this lion from? It's not a Samaritan lion, is it? That Samaria was the northern part. It's a Judean lion. Now, the Bible mentions lions a couple of times. You probably are thinking of the verse that Peter writes, the devil is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And that would certainly apply here, right? The, the, this prophet of God knowingly disobeys God. Uh, it's really an act of rebellion. And so he opens himself up to the devil, devil's attacks and the devil is able to get him. That applies, absolutely. Who else is referred to as a lion? Jesus. Jesus. Revelation chapter 5. As John is looking at the throne room in heaven, and that book with seven seals, there is nobody able to open it. And then Jesus shows up in that vision, and he's described both as a lamb that was slain and as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, let's just look at this whole story in the end time context that we've been looking at. And I'm going to put lion down here at the bottom. If we could look at this as a very rough, basic timeline of events leading up to the return of Christ, you have the setting up of the mark of the beast worldwide. Then you have the loud cry, which is issued here. Then you have the mark of the beast, which is enforced. Then you have these final deceptions, including Satan's counterfeit of the coming of Christ. And why is Satan counterfeiting the return of Christ? Because he knows that the true lion of the tribe of Judah is about to show up on the scene. Now, do you look forward to the return of Christ? Amen. Amen. We all do. That's why we're here today. Do you want to be able to stand in his presence when he comes back? <clears throat> will everybody have that experience or will some people not survive that experience. Some people won't survive the experience. I mean, the Bible tells us in many places, Revelation chapter 6 at the end, there will be people when they realize that Christ is coming back and that they have worshipped the wrong Christ. They're actually going to run, run away from the lion of the tribe of Judah. And they're going to ask for the rocks and the hills to fall on them. And the Bible says that many will be slain by the brightness of Christ's coming. So what makes the difference? See, this man of God represents this remnant church that I want to be part of and you want to be part of. Amen? Amen. So how do we get through all of this so we are not killed when we meet the lion? You see, there's a reason the Bible doesn't say that the lion snuck up from behind and attacked the guy. When Jesus comes back, he's not sneaking up on anybody. It's going to be a figure in the road, right? The world is going this direction, and all of a sudden, there Jesus is. And some will be ready to meet him, and some won't. So what makes the difference? This was not the only prophet who had a run-in with lions. Can you think of any other prophets in the Bible that had a, an experience with lions? Daniel comes to mind, and there was also a really strong guy. Samson. Now, both of their experiences turned out differently, didn't it? When they met the lion. The lion did not overcome Samson. He ripped it apart. The lions did not overcome Daniel. He survived that experience. So what 
makes the difference. Well, <clears throat> at least at that moment in Samson's life, he was faithful to God. And so he had the power of the Holy Spirit, didn't he? Samson was filled with the Holy Spirit. Lesson number one, if we do not have the Holy Spirit, we will not be prepared to meet the lion from the tribe of Judah. And that experience will destroy us. What about Daniel's experience? Turn with me to Daniel chapter 6. And we'll look at his answer. He actually tells the king why he survived that night with the lions. Daniel chapter 6. Daniel has spent the entire night in the lion's den. Early the next morning, the king goes, opens the, the gate or the pit, whatever it is, and he says, are you still alive? And Daniel says, oh yes, live forever, king. And then he says in verse 22, My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lions' mouths that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him, innocency was found in me. And also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. According to Daniel, the reason he survived that experience is because he was innocent, right? He had done no wrong. There was nothing in him, no sin that could be found. Now, in Revelation chapter 14, we are given a description of the 144,000 who are those that give this warning message. And what does the Bible say? Revelation chapter 14, verses 4 and 5. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God, and to the Lamb. And then verse 5 says, In their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Friends, this is why it's so critical for us to understand our message and our mission. This man of God had a message and a mission. The message was to give a warning against this in, in, in particular. But it wasn't just to give a verbal message. It was to live a life that demonstrated obedience. He nailed the first part, didn't he? And he stumbled on the second part. Because he didn't think that that obedience part was really so critical, so important. Oh, God loves people too much. He'll turn a blind eye, keep living however I want, right? A lot of people that think this way. Now, we're not saved by our obedience. Praise God for that. But God has promised that He can help us overcome anything and everything that stands between us and Him. And that power of heaven is at our fingertips if we are just willing to claim it and ask for it. So why did I first title this <laughs> message in the bulletin, Adventism's Final Deceptions. A lot of times we are, I'll speak for myself. A lot of times I have thought, we just need to give this warning about the Sabbath Sunday issue, and then that's it. We've done our job. And there's actually a lot more that happens on the other side of that message. If we give that message faithfully, which we must, and praise God, the Bible promises that he will have a people that does it. But if we give that message, focusing on the fourth commandment, and then we continue living, breaking the other nine, what kind of message is given to the world? Can God use that to bring him glory? <laughs> Obviously not. James wrote, if we break the law in one point, we break it in every point. The visible issue at the end of time will be which day are you worshiping on. But beneath that and behind it and, and surrounding it is a bigger issue, and that is can God's law be kept? Can he enable human beings, sinful humans, can he enable them to live in harmony with his will? That's the question that needs to be answered. And it needs to be demonstrated. God wanted to demonstrate it through this prophet. That didn't work out. And he needs it demonstrated at the end. 
And the Bible promises that it will be. So the only question really that is left to us is, will I be part of that demonstration? <laughs> I want to be part of it, and I want each one of you to be part of it. And God has promised no matter what is happening in your life, no matter what temptations or weaknesses you may have developed through bad choices or through heredity or whatever's happened, He's strong enough. He can overcome that. He just needs your yes. He needs your permission. He needs you to ask Him to take control of the life. He says, I'll do the rest. And then when I meet you on the road back to Judah, you'll be ready and you can stand in my presence. What an amazing promise. So friends, what a picture of these final events. What a picture we have here. You know, God didn't include this in the Bible just to occupy 45 minutes of our time on a Sabbath morning, did he? He wants us to take these things to heart. He wants us to take courage and to grow in faith and to leave here a little bit closer to him than when we came. So we're going to pray that that will be our experience. We'll do that, and then we'll sing our closing hymn. If that's your desire, would you stand with me and we can pray together? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, the Bible is an amazing book. Somehow you have worked through history with people that have free will to create these stories that contain so much truth and, and prophecy. Only God can do that. Only the divine creator can do that. And as we look at what you've done in the past, Lord, it gives us faith and confidence that you can work miracles in our lives as well. Father, every single one of us is here today hurting, broken, struggling in some way, maybe in more than one way, looking for answers, looking for strength, looking for that courage and faith that we know we need but we don't always feel. And I just simply pray that you would work in every life here, in every family that's represented, and that you would prepare us and enable us to be your faithful people today, that we can be ready to meet you when you do appear in those clouds of glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.